Last episode, we covered the development of the British Pattern 14. In 1917, the US entered the war and was caught very short on equipment, just like the Brits. Thankfully, they had three factories ready to produce a new 30-06 service rifle. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the U.S. Rifle Model 1917. Let's take a look in that light box. Just like its precursor, the Pattern 14, this gun is 46 and a quarter inches long, but it weighs only 9.2 pounds. That's 0.2 pounds lighter. It chambers the 30-06 cartridges, feeding from the same double stack magazine, stripper clip system. We're all good to go there, except we can squeeze in a sixth round. Now, much like Britain before the war, the US had a small expeditionary army instead of a large standing one. At that time, the standard U.S. rifle was the Springfield 1903. It was produced at both Springfield and the Rock Island arsenals. Although Rock Island had been mothballed before the start of the war. Along with the U.S. entry into the war was also the U.S. draft, instituted much faster than the British one. And so you're going to see a massive influx of troops from, again, hundreds of thousands to millions. And with that, we're going to need more equipment and especially rifles and we're going to very very quickly outstrip our inventory and supply to help mitigate the problem stocks of Krag jorgensen rifles were issued in training and domestic guard duties also large numbers of ross mark ii were purchased again only for training luckily for the u.s government they had been producing domestically a number of rifle designs for foreign powers and one of those just happened to be the British Pattern 14, as we covered in our last episode. That means that if they want three assembly lines running these guns, they just gotta buy them straight off the British, who remember, bought them outright in our last episode. Well, the British paid roughly 20 mil to get those three assembly lines, and they would sell it rather cheaply over to the US government for nine. Over half off, guys, go USA. All right. Uh, now, uh, the government in the U.S. had seen all the problems that the war office had getting this thing off the ground, and especially with interchangeability. So, way ahead of the game, early in 1917, they were already looking at how to produce the Pattern 14 and 30-06 and realign the three factories onto one standard pattern. Uh, a lot of effort would be put into this, and in the end, two out of three ain't bad. We'll get there in a moment. But uh, by August of 1917, the complete plans, as they should be done, universalized to all manufacturers, were ready. They were in manufacturers' hands. It was time to produce the 1917. And so, let's go ahead and quickly take a look, and I know that's not a lot of work up, but hey, all the work was done last episode. Let's take a look at what exactly they came up with. Now this should seem insanely familiar. The only real difference is if we flip this guy around, we don't have a volley sight, we don't have a front volley sight, and we don't have that British uh, unit marking disc. These are just plain sided stocks. Um, otherwise, not a lot of changes. If we're looking at the gun itself, it's the same Mauser action, it's still cock and close. Most of the dimensions are the same, although parts are not interchangeable because of that re-standardization. The big difference here is that we are rechambered for the 30-06 cartridge. This rimless cartridge had a slightly higher velocity and was a little better suited to the P13 pattern than that British 303. And because of the extra space from getting rid of that rim, we can now fit six rounds into the previously five round integral magazine. All we really have to do to this gun is get that bolt out and apart, otherwise it's a bolt action rifle. I'm not pulling screws on this, guys. So, if we look at that left side, we have a regular Mauser style bolt release. We can pull the bolt to the rear, yank on that guy, pull the bolt out. Super simple. Set this guy aside, whoop, dunk, and take a look at that bolt. Now, this guy was designed to be disassembled without special tools, but that doesn't mean that you can just do it barehanded unless you've got some serious thumbnails. Instead, they wanted you to rely on a casing. 
Now, uh, this is a spent 303, so nobody shoot me that's not 30-06, but hey, the extra rim kind of helps. You can still do this pretty well with 30-06. But all we really have to do is look at, and let me get this aligned for you, there's a hook on the caulking piece that we can lip into and pull back on that caulking piece in order to disassemble this bolt. Um, I'm gonna lift the caulking piece out of the way. I'm sorry guys, it's hard to keep this in camera and still do it. I'm gonna lift that caulking piece out of the way, and it's a lot of tension, and then I'm gonna start rotating the shroud, okay? So I've, I've rotated the shroud a little bit. I'm gonna have to keep pressure on that and keep rotating until she comes completely loose. So give me just a moment. And let me tell you that dog leg is your worst enemy as it keeps coming around and wrapping you in the knuckle as you continue to try to do this. Oof, case in point. So we'll probably just go ahead and do a time lapse. Okay, sorry guys, that's just kind of tricky. Honestly, a key ring works even better, but I just want to make sure you know you can do it with the casing. All right, so now that we're clear of the bolt body, we can keep rotating this guy. Pull him away, bolt body's done for. That's all disassembled, you can clean that out. Next up, we are gonna have to deal with this caulking shroud and caulking piece, which is pretty simple, but unlike the you know later Car 98K or something you're familiar with, we're not really set up for it to have it easily. You wanna have a nice firm surface, but you don't want to be doing this on stone or anything. You don't wanna chip that firing pin. But what you're gonna try to do is simply depress the whole shroud, so you're gonna grab that with your hand, depress it, until you can turn the caulking piece 90 degrees counterclockwise, lift, and then let her out. Honestly, you could rotate in either direction, but for some reason I feel like counterclockwise works a lot easier for me. So once she's apart, there's our shroud, there's our caulking piece, firing pin and spring, bolt body, and it's all outside the rifle. All right, that's pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and throw this gun, sans animation, I'm sorry guys, it's the same setup, over to May. We'll go ahead and load a single extra cartridge this time. Otherwise, once more, same as before. Let's check that target. Nice! Okay, Othias, you can have it back now. Man, I can't wait to see what you say about this gun, May. Alright, uh, back to business. These guys uh, really benefited from that P14 program, like we said, but that doesn't mean that it made it perfectly smooth sailing because as the US entered the war, there was massive competition and huge scarcity in the market. So uh, you're gonna see things like steel and especially seasoned wood for stocks and things like that. It's gonna be a big problem that will be ultimately solved by technology and careful planning, but the manpower issue is almost unavoidable because you now need so many experts and you cannot make them overnight. You cannot produce them in six months time. They have to be veterans of their industry. And so because of sort of corporate competition, you're gonna see a turnover rate in these war industries of almost 30% per month. One in three guys is not sticking around for more than four weeks. And by the way, the next two guys might be gone in the next eight weeks. And so this sort of uh, circular Pac-Man style cannibalism 
it really messes up the whole industry and it ruins production across the board. But luckily, Winchester, weirdly enough, would come up with an ingenious solution to this problem. You see, they created part-time positions. And this was important because they could fit it to a number of different types of people, most notably retired workers wanting to earn a bit more without breaking their backs, students, and they also wildly extended these options to women, housewives, wherever possible, freeing up more experienced workers. These strategies would spread to the other factories, and soon things were humming along much more smoothly. Being the first to balance out their production needs, Winchester would also be the first to rush these rifles into the market, which put them slightly ahead of the standardization effort, which means that the two Remington companies, Remington UMC Avilion and Remington Eddystone, they're going to have mostly synchronized rifles in terms of part interchangeability. The Winchesters, however, are going to stick out like a sore thumb and be very hard to interchange with the others. So much so that field armorers would actually request that they stop sending these Ws to the front. The initial contracts for all three producers were quite low, but final figures would be staggering. You see, with all the extra workers and the simpler rifle pattern, output compared to the P-14 was nearly quintuple. As a matter of fact, by the end of the war, production of these guns had reached nearly 10,000 units daily. That means that production of the 1917 rifle alone by those three factories was equal or greater than the combined production of rifles in Britain and France per month, not the whole course of the war, but per month. That is wild. Not only did the 1917 become so rapidly overproduced, but those numbers dwarfed the Springfield 1903 production, which means that the U.S. had a unique situation in which its second standard rifle, its auxiliary rifle, rapidly outnumbered its primary service arm. That means that despite the U.S. obsession with the 1903 in imagery at the time and in our collective memory of World War I, the average soldier was armed with a 1917. And unlike the U.K., the U.S. would put these guns to work in the trenches. Being widely issued, however, did not mean that they were widely appreciated. You see, compared to the 1903, the 1917 is quite heavy. It's a little longer. It's got a real front-heavy barrel, and it's just not as American sporting-centric. It, it doesn't fit with the psyche at that time. And yes, the aperture sights are great. Yes, it's very precise. But uh, the U.S. liked shoot and move. The U.S. soldiers were perfectly comfortable with tangent sights. They didn't completely appreciate the aperture. <sighs> Although we will see later on, the 1903 does get a rear aperture, so it's not like they didn't take advice off this gun. But largely, the 1917 to the U.S. soldier was forgettable. And so, post-war, a lot of them were sold off commercially into the civilian market. They were converted to hunting rifles, things like that. You'll see lots of these guys chopped and modified in various ways from you know, almost 80 years ago. Uh, additionally, the guns would be put into storage. That would come up later in World War II. And also, a lot were sort of given out as associate aid, not to foreign powers necessarily, but a good example would be the nominally independent Philippine forces were widely armed with 1917s before the Japanese invasion. And speaking of World War II, a lot of these guns were dug up and refurbished for use in that conflict. Now, they really weren't frontline, but they would see guard duty and other things like that, and they were properly inspected and rebuilt if necessary. As a matter of fact, you can find them with 40s dates of Johnson automatics and high standard barrels from where they were refit. Uh, many of these, like I said, guards, uh, real line duty, but also given out to proper allies this time, most notably tons sent over to the British for home guard use, where they would be lined up alongside the P-14, slapped with a little paint, and therefore kept in two different calibers. A fair number were also sent to China, where some were even modified into a carbine version, which I've covered in an article that I'll link in the description below. While we're talking about carbines, I need to show you this little guy. We found him alone at the Springfield Armory National Historic Site. He came with some, you know, provenance because he was sent to the museum all the way back in 1920 from Captain J.L. Aney of the Captured Material section. 
and he was ordered to secure items for the museum, and this is one of the things he sent back, with a description. American Enfield Magazine Carbine Model 1917. This gun is of extreme interest since it has been cut down in the field to fit it for trench warfare. Probably a one-off, but I thought you guys would appreciate it. I should also probably mention that all of these versions of both the 1917 and P14 were fitted with the same 16.5 inch monster bayonet. This was based off the British pattern 1907, but modified to work with an actual muzzle ring. Two grooves were cut into the grip to help differentiate it from that aforementioned pattern. The US would adopt the same bayonet, although they added a little clearing hole in the pommel, that's to help clean really the only big difference between the two. It's also worth noting that the same bayonet would be paired with the Winchester 1897 trench gun. While World War II was the end of the 1917 in terms of military service in most places around the world, uh, the design really didn't halt on just the 1917, it just didn't get a lot of traction in its other forms. You see, Winchester and Remington would both try several models of guns based on the 1917 action. Uh, coming out of Winchester, we have Thomas Johnson's Model D, which was a sort of simplification and streamlining of the 1917. Additionally, it moved that safety from the right-hand side back onto the caulking piece like a Mauser. This gun was uh, prototyped in a number of different calibers in an attempt to get contracts around the world. Five were sent over to Russia. These were so well received that they ordered another 500. Now, of these 500 trials guns, we don't know where the heck they went because the Russian Civil War put the kibosh on the whole plan. Although it's kind of interesting to think that Russia may have well replaced the Mosin Nagant with a Winchester design modification of the British design Pattern 14 rifle. Moving over to Remington, as many of you may know that they issued the Model 30 civilian rifle, which was based off the 1917 action, but a lot of you might not know that they actually came out with an entirely different gun in around the mid 30s. Uh, at this point, they sold to Honduras what they were calling their Model 34, which I actually happen to have one here in the uh, armory. Now this guy was another modification of the 1917, definitely resembles the Model 30. However, uh, instead of any of that rear sight like we're used to back here, they took what looks like a sight straight off a rolling block and put it right up on the barrel like you'd be familiar with with a 1903. So uh, handling this guy, honestly, it feels like a hybrid between the Springfield and the 1917. It's pretty sweet. Uh, this guy's in seven millimeter Mauser, by the way. All right, so with all of those little iterations wrapped up, I think we can finally go over to May and get her opinion on shooting the actual 1917. All right, we made room for May. Let's get her opinion on not this one, the other one. Dang, these things look alike. Okay, let's get her opinion on the US model of 1917. First off, why don't you tell us comparatively how are you feeling about their ergonomics now? I know we covered 99% of it last time, but just is there any difference that stands out to you? You know, there really aren't a lot of differences. It looks a lot, it looks a, pretty much the same, but there are very minor differences. We're missing this fat belly down here that before I talked about how I kind of liked it, but now that I've got these finger grooves and it's thinner, I don't know, this kind of feels like a fine instrument, you know, it just feels like I've got a good solid grip on it. And it doesn't have those volley sights, so there's really nothing there to distract me, which, you know, they weren't even using them. They were pretty much taking them out by the Second War. Um, but overall, this is just kind of tighter, leaner, meaner. Yeah, I would say this is going to be a shorter Mayversation than usual, because realistically we covered a lot of this. But, but, there's one key difference between these two rifles, which is the uh, removal of the rimmed 303 cartridge and the inclusion of the American 30-06 cartridge. Uh, do you want to do sort of a brief comparison of the two uh, in terms of using the same rifle system, but with just the two different cartridges? Starting out with the stripper clip, the 30-06 ones were a lot easier than the British ones. I have an extra round with this, so six rounds. That's a plus. I'm never going to turn that down. Uh, the round actually has a little more oomph to it, a little more power, so that's great. I appreciate that. And then also, I'll mention that it's rimless. So that's, that's nice. I appreciate that. Um, also, I will say, 
it's an American cartridge and I'm an American girl, so I, I kind of prefer the 30 -06. Did you just gently air guitar at me? Maybe. Uh, guys, I promised that we were taking this show seriously. Well, some of us. Hey. Anyway, um, uh, that aside, I can't even recover from this. Okay, that aside, let's actually wrap this thing up and get a real opinion on this rifle. So, seriously, please, if you were issued this gun in World War I, how disappointed or excited are you? I'm pretty sure everyone knows what my answer is going to be. It's a definite yes. And also, I want to point out, I think this benefited coming after the P14, because, like I mentioned before, it's just, it's tighter, it's cleaner, it's, it's all there. So... Yeah, so far, this has actually been my darling. It's been my favorite rifle to date. We'll see if anything can top this one. Yeah, I have to say, uh, man. Yeah. I think the British sort of, they didn't give it a good enough chance, or maybe they were just really worried about that rimmed cartridge. But this has to be one of the most underrated guns in history. And, and I say that sort of back then, because nowadays most people know the 1917. Not a lot of you are surprised by anything we're saying in this episode. But I still want to point out it was radically underappreciated by the military forces in its day. The gun is strong. The gun is reliable. The gun is powerful. Uh, the 1917 really does, for a lot of people who have handled them, put a warm spot in your heart. All right, uh, with all that wrapped up, I am going to have to put us over to our updates. But I want to thank all of you for turning, tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Or if you're watching this later, I guess you get to just go to the next video, you lazy anyway. All right. Thanks, guys. America. everyone not a lot to report this week and hopefully not too terribly much to report for a number of weeks because we are laying low and rebuilding our funds from all this travel uh, we're also going to try to put some work into our new vehicle so that we can get around more often and further and bring you more interesting things from uh, larger museums that are further away from us I will say that we are trying out a podcast idea with the help of historical firearms and Nathaniel F over at the firearm blog but uh, it's not quite ready yet. However, since we really only have updates every other week, if you want to keep on top of these small things, also some images and things that I like to put up, follow us on Facebook or keep an eye on us on Twitter, that sort of thing. Pick your social media poison and, and try to keep up a little tighter if you want to see what's going on on these sort of side projects. All right, as always, we cannot do this without our patrons, and I have a huge announcement. We have cleared the 2000 mark, which means that we are well afloat, and the project can keep carrying on, and we are starting to actually be able to pay a handful of personal bills with the extra spillover, which is super nice because I am logging a good 60 hours a week at this point. All right, we love you all. We thank you all for your support. Keep an eye out for t-shirts in the next week or so. There's going to be a big Indiegogo project there. And uh, again, we're going to do another poster at the end of this year, just like we did the previous two years. That design is being worked on as we speak. All right, guys.